everyone, and welcome to the David Goodman Reality and Truth Show. My name is Vanita Lambert. I'm the host, and I really appreciate you guys tuning in. We have a very special guest today. Her name is Miriam Stevenson, and she has a surprise for us, a surprise story. Is that right? Yes. It's, it's such a surprise, I don't even know about it. <laughs> but um, the last time that you were on the show, welcome to the show, Miriam. Thank you for coming back. This is what your oh, thank second time. Thank you for time. having me. I, I wanted to continue, and I'm so glad that you invited me back again. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're going to so jump right into your story. So we're going to recap of the last two shows just to get everybody caught up on, you know, the story, the very intriguing story, which I had questions, but she couldn't answer because you had to check some things out, right? I'll try to discuss as soon as I get it, because I want to tell the America more detail today. Well, you go right ahead. Hi, America. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm here to talk about Mr. Joe Colombo. 60 years ago, when there was social unrest, can you imagine that there was one or even more, pers more, one or more Italian people who are interested in having social justice. I consider him a civil rights activist, even though a lot of people do not. But I want to recap what I was talking about in my last two previous shows. This all started at the Bachelor Three, and um, when I was introduced to Ray Abusey, and one thing led to another. Tell us what the Bachelor Three is. What is that? Is that a bar? Okay. Restaurant? Um, what is that? Okay, he invited me to, <laughs> when we first met, he invited me the next week to come have dinner. I didn't realize it was going to be dinner at the restaurant, the Bachelor's Three. Okay. And I also didn't realize that when they say dinner and you're Italian, that meant everybody. <laughs> you know, their friends. Their know, family. Do you see the Godfather? <laughs> you know, I, you know when they when they go on a date, yeah. the whole family comes. <laughs> okay, so. I go for dinner, and we're sitting there, everybody's sitting there socializing after everyone was introduced. And this big Caucasian guy comes over with a pitcher of water and pours it over Ray's head. <laughs> I, I, before I could even react, out of the back door, out of the back room, it, it looked like he entered from the floor. This other guy came out and he punched him. So they start, I mean, it was a fist fight, like a gladiator war fight to the end. And which other guy was beat, beaten real bad. Right. But he had no business coming over and saying, so now you eat with niggas. <gasps> so I'm like, I know he ain't talking about Surprise. me. Surprise. <laughs> oh my so, God. Imagine Bubba Smith, a lot of other celebrities. The place was packed because that's where people went and came. I was in the industry too, even though I was in high school. I had a part-time job at the record company. And for this guy to get beaten and blood splattered all over the place, I was licking my lips because it pleased me that someone came up to defend his friend. Not me, but your friend, your amigos. <laughs> so. We couldn't continue eating that night, so right. he put me in a cab and sent me. But 
This was the beginning of injustices that we have in this country, and which you can't do that nowadays, you know, because you'll get arrested. Back then, because of the Jim Crow laws, there would be no arrests. But let's move on ahead. We started seeing each other in the club. And then uh, one day, I went to Bloomingdale's because I wanted to pick up something. So I come out the door like these Caucasian guys dressed in black surrounded me. You know, they said FBI. I said, excuse me? Oh and my they goodness. said, um, can we talk to you for a minute? So all other customers, because it was a Friday, a weekend, a weekend night, they were like, leave that little girl alone. What does that little girl do, you know? Did she take something? What's going on? You know, the F Yeah. So then they started questioning me uh, what was going on down at the club. I said, I've only been to the club twice. But then I said, Miriam, shut your mouth and put your feet in gear. I ran. <laughs> I ran. From the FBI. I ran all the way back to the club. So as I was crossing the street, I ran in front of all the cars and buses, and I ran into the club. And they were like, what's, what's wrong? What happened? What's going on? I said, they're chasing me. I don't know what they want. They're the feds. And they, uh, they said, number one, you never run. You stand there, and you talk, and you call us. I said, it's because. Blacks and Puerto I mean Puerto Ricans too. We never experienced federal agents coming in our neighborhood, you know. So this is something I've heard of. Even my brother who did biz, he said, Man, I never met a <laughs> FBI, a secret agent, man. So they said, Don't ever run. I said I would never run from the NYPD <laughs> because they were the law and order back then. You know, the judge, right. the jury, and the sentences. That back in it. that day, yeah, pretty back much. Back then, yeah. Back then. So as time moved on, we came into another problem and which we had to solve. And it was basically on me. So I had to go to some street people to ask for help. Can you talk about Because I accidentally dumped a couple of kilos. <laughs> so. <laughs> Me and another person, I'm not going to give names, we figured out something. But in figuring out something, we didn't realize there's rules on the street and other organizations because at that time, the mafia didn't have a name. They didn't exist. Um, they were just the white boys. The white boys came and, you know, messed us up, you know, when they came into the numbers rings or whatever. So it wouldn't be until the middle, late 60s that we started calling the mobsters, which Colombo was against. So I said, I did a little research, so I said, you're not mobsters, you're the black hand because that's what originated from Italy. Back in the 18th century, 
They were like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords to defend their country against the raiders. They call themselves the Black Hand because black is indefinite. So he said, I, wow. I He's, have a question. <laughs> I want to go back to <laughs> the second time you got in trouble So <laughs> with the kilos. <laughs> How did you get them? We got out of that mess. <laughs> then a couple of months, see, I'm skipping over a lot of things. Okay. In a couple of months, we were sitting on a Saturday because I, there was nothing sexual going on. I wasn't, I'd never even been up to the penthouse, you know, nothing sexual. We were sitting in the restaurant and, um, all of a sudden, boom, through the door, you know, everybody get out. Like, I look at Ray, like, who is this? And... Everybody get out like a raid? Like the police yeah, came in and raided? Yeah, they had okay. to leave, yeah. So then I proceeded to try to collect my things. They were like, oh, no, not you. <laughs> so... I said, what's going on? And then this person said, why don't you all tell me what's going on? Ray, what's going on? Apparently everybody knew each other but, you know, me. So he said, you, you know I was sent here. Something's happening. I, I didn't understand. So then him and Ray went to the bar and they were talking and then he came back over to me and he said that um, he had to come down to clean from Italy to clean up a mess. I'm like, what could have happened? So he's laughing, looking at me. <laughs> well, something happened in here. Um, and that's what I want to find out from you. So I said, I don't understand who you are. So he said, he's a cleaner. Mm. So I said, <laughs> he said, you know what a cleaner is? I said, yeah, I watched one of those monster movies where they sent in a cleaner from space and he swept, you know, cleaned up everything. He said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind of cleaner. <laughs> But something on that order, um, <laughs> he said, you're going to have to be very direct with me and tell me everything that happened from the day you set foot in here because everything that he done, and you shouldn't even be sitting in here because of your age, I don't even know why he didn't take you to the other apartment, you know. The penthouse? No, okay. not even that. He was angry about that. They were angry about that. They threw me out of that. I, I was, after that, I was going to the other, other, you know, three blocks away. They control a lot of property and own a lot. What of happened in that house? Hmm? <laughs> what was going on in that other house? <laughs> it, was, it was gorgeous. It had like the Roman pillars inside. It was prettier than the penthouse. Oh, okay. So it was for like the younger girls? Hmm? Was it for like the younger girls or his private Well, I couldn't get no or... younger than me. No, I mean, I guess at that period of time, it wasn't supposed to be with a black girl. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's where all the black girls went? Okay. No. This was the first that they, you know, they encountered this kind of problem. But he didn't call it a problem. He, he was like, the, you ever see that movie, The Man from Flint? Oh, Man Flint? He was just like a James so. Coburn. He was slim, his attitude, he made you laugh. He was just like a secret agent man, you know. So, 
we went out to another club that they own all the way up in the 70s. So we were sitting outside talking. Okay. So he said, oh, wow, I see they already got you spotted. There's FBI guys over there looking at us talking, so I can't sit out here with you. So I got to take you to the apartment because I got to know what's going on. You know, I'm not going to jump you, you know, but we can't talk on the outside and out in a bar, you know, or even a restaurant. Because interracial relationships back then? No, because of the FBI. Oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, they were really interested in you a lot. Oh, yeah. I was... Because um, you were involved. I, I really... Um, he was so enjoyable, but he didn't stay that long. You know, after he took care of what he had to take care of, he left. So then the next weekend when we met, we came to the club. We were all sitting down talking, and boom, once again, someone comes to the door and says, everybody get out. This time it was the high officials from Italy, and they look at him and talk to him in Sicilian. What, what's taking you so long? What's going on here? What, what, what's, what is she doing here, you know? Who is she, you know? Um, so I'm like trying to question them because they were speaking Sicilian. And he was trying to tell them, but they were getting agitated and I was getting agitated. So they wanted to dragged my ass back to um, Sicily. Oh my so, God. <laughs> I, told, I told him I couldn't go nowhere because my mother just had a heart attack. I was still in school, even though I was working part time. I started naming all these things I was doing. I didn't even know where Sicily was. I knew it was somewhere near Africa, you know? Why did they want to take you there? I mean, what oh. was the purpose? Oh, to teach me because I was insolent. <laughs> <laughs> teach you a lesson? <laughs> teach me some manners. Okay. <laughs> so, then they did a whole lot of debating. And then when he came back, he said, I want you to meet me here tomorrow. And I'm going to introduce you to someone. I'm going to introduce you to a Greek guy, and you're going to have to stay and do what he says. Oh, that was getting interesting. <laughs> because you have to sort of disappear a little bit, you know, before too much gossip, you know. At that time, I didn't understand because I didn't know there was a mafia, you know. The five families, you know, because once, you know, once they find out or they knew about, like, what the hell is going on, you know. So I said yes, but I said, you know, as long as I can see you, he said, no, I'm going to be going back home. Back to Italy? Yeah, back to okay. Italy. I'm not staying. Okay. And at that point, I started crying because... Even though I love Ray, this guy was like, what would you call a Caesar, a Roman fantasy? <laughs> he had that swagger that you just couldn't avoid. <laughs> and so you were dating Ray or you were just hanging out with Ray and just involved, but you um, liked the other we were, Italian we were, guy? Um, he wasn't committed, so it's yeah, okay to like somebody we, else. You know, he, yeah. It's hard to explain. It wasn't um, strictly he, platonic relationship. 
Because of the Jim Crow laws, he wanted to prove a point. You don't t tell me what to do. If I want to sit and open with my black friend, or this black friend, see, with the males, there was never no problem. And then he realized when he brought me or to dinner, it became a problem because I was a girl. Exactly. Now you understand. Exactly. I do understand that. That's. <laughs> they thought something was going on, and you was what, 17 at the time? You were in high school. Yeah, right? I was 17, yeah. 18. Okay. So he went back and. The Greek guy, he owned a newspaper. So I called him one day and said, can we meet and talk? Because I feel very anxious. So he said yes. So when I met him, we went to a restaurant. And I'd never been to a Greek restaurant. And his wife was there. Oh my goodness! He took you to the restaurant with his wife. Oh my goodness! His whole, you know, <laughs> the whole family. Because this wasn't a love affair. Still, this was business. Yeah. See, that's one thing I like about them. They separate. This wasn't a love affair. Right. And his right. wife was very nice because she knew this wasn't a, you know. And since I was a little girl to them, because don't forget they were still like. 40 years old by then, yeah. Like, um, you know, you're not going to hurt or kill, you know, you know. So I'm they were th very I'm thinking, nice. I'm thinking something else. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm thinking something else. Okay. <laughs> Even so, though it was business, you know, they usually don't have their wives around. You see, around. as black females, we're not that. Not what? <laughs> bring, you know, like if your husband was to bring another female, I kill him. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> I'd be a widow right now. <laughs> See, that's what I think. <laughs> because you and I are different. more organized than we were. Well, and, I don't I know. Have to, I have to give them. Um, I think tolerable. I, I think instead of organized, I think tolerable would be a better word for that. I would, we, I would give them all the credit <laughs> that they didn't degrade me or make me feel uncomfortable. Or think that you were there for other reasons. Right. Other because than, he, he, yeah. like a, like a like, mistress. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. <Because I> have <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter what age you are. If you're like 17, 18 or whatever, and you're a female, you know, even though you're just a friend, it always starts out like that. So I'm thinking they could have thought that, you know, thinking in another manner, like there was a relationship. But um, this went on for about a month. Okay. Then he said, um, oh, I want you to go, come somewhere with me. Um, there was going to be this bodybuilding contest. And um, I can't even remember where, what auditorium it was in. And Peter Lupus was going to be there. So I said, OK. Who's Peter Lupus? Is that the Greek guy? He was on Mission Impossible. Oh, OK. OK, so and he's the first man to do a frontal nude. First mission in Fully Bible? nude. Fully nude where? On a magazine or? No, and um, I don't know if it was. Um, <laughs> that could be interesting. <laughs> Penthouse, you... one of the magazines back then. I wasn't in. Penthouse into... Playboy, one of those. Yeah, Playgirl. one of those magazines. Um, oh, wow. It wasn't Playboy, but he did a frontal, you know, because men, <laughs> you know, they don't do a frontal, only females. But he did, he was the first man to do a frontal. Okay. Um, so we go backstage, so everybody's getting dressed, you know, the female contingent, 
putting on the earrings, getting all fancy and dressed. I'm getting excited because I've never seen such glamour and such pretty costumes before. So he says, um, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, you have to walk across the stage. Put on one I of those said, pretty costumes. I said, have you lost your <laughs> mind? I never even put on a two-piece bathing suit. I only wore one piece. And he's like, no, I didn't leave my mind. So <laughs> the other girls, they heard it. And they said, came over to me when he stepped away and said, you better, you know, do that. Do what he says. <laughs> you know, like. There's other things worse than you walking across the stage. In like, a skimpy you know, outfit. What's wrong with us? I said, nothing. I said, but you're all prepared. I mean, I mean, I never did such, you know. They have experience, yeah. And they're trained. Okay, so what am I going to wear? I said, I have on the big, you know, those big old panties, you know, the drawers. <laughs> That's what they call them, draws. <laughs> <laughs> the big square ones, they're like, yeah, they look like <laughs> boxer shorts. <laughs> so oh my God. Had, uh, one of the girls had <laughs> a new set she bought. So she went and told them so he could buy it so I could wear that. And I would have to, I couldn't use nobody's shoes. So I would, you know, they were all barefooted anyway when they walked across. So when I got outside the curtain, I was shaking. Like, what do I do? So when I get to the stage, the only thing I could think of was shake your butt. Like, <laughs> Big Frida calls it the bounce, but that's what I do. And then everybody starts screaming and crying. So I, so I she just kept, kept doing shaking. It. <laughs> so then I just quickly walked off. So he said, good job, good job. So I got dressed and went home. Then a couple of days later, he said, um, I want to introduce you to somebody. So he took me to this restaurant. And we walked through the door, and all I could hear was, what the hell are you doing? Why are you bringing her in here? Who is she? And then the Greek guy said, she's yours, mine. <laughs> Have you lost your mind? I live down the street. This is my house, my home. He said, well, if you don't take her, then the next bidder, well, I said bidder. Oh, bitter my will God. Take her. <laughs> so they were bidding on you guys? That's why you're walking across the stage? <laughs> I think it was just me, yeah. No, I, think, I probably why were the other girls there? But anyway, that's yeah. What, that's what we I'm don't. We, yeah, I'm. I'm only talking about me. I'm only okay. into me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so he said she was supposed to be for my friend. I told my friend I'll do anything to keep her straight and clean. So I still didn't understand. So he said, well. It couldn't go through with your friend. He couldn't take possession. So you have to take possession of your property. Wow. So I'm looking at him like, because Mr. Colombo was so cute, like, oh, don't let them take you, though. Know? So, so did he like, take I'm you? I'm already dead. <laughs> 50 people already called my house, probably. <laughs> the boss is probably already thinking of ways to chop me in a million pieces. 
So he said, I would have been scared. I'll take the property. I'll take the property. Okay. So he said, but then the uh, Greek said, oh, no, you have to take the property. You can't take the property and let it go because apparently he knew him. He said, well, you can't tell me what to do. If it's, yeah. So he said, you have to do something with this girl. Like what? <laughs> so he's like, well, you going to stand there and watch me? Then, you know, he said, get the F out of my... He starts screaming, and then his boy from downstairs came upstairs, and his boy's like, what is she doing? What, how does she get in here? What does this girl want? We're not running a kitty farm. And he said, oh, he strolled in here and said, I have to claim this property because I always keep, he said, remember to me, always keep a promise you make to a friend. I never go back on my word. Your word is your bond because that's the only thing we had back in Sicily. Is your word, you're right. So it meant something back then. Now it's just words. <laughs> so he was like talking to the other guy. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to clean this up. She's going to kill me. Everybody in the neighborhood must think that I'm running Harlem or something. You know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I got you. Because <laughs> <laughs> don't been... forget, this was in. Um, I'm um, Brooklyn somewhere. I, I don't remember the, 60s. the area. You know. In the 60s, right? So he said, um, you know I'm not going to keep you. You know, he said, you know, <laughs> he said, I have to think of what I'm going to do with you. So I said, as long as you think and do something, positive. I want to stay here. He said, well, you're not staying here, you know. And you're like, not staying like with me. Like live there, but stay you there. You're going to wherever you live, and I'm going to think of something. But I thought he had to keep you. Hmm? I thought he had to keep you. I thought he had oh, to no, keep you. Oh, no, not actually. Um, you know how Italians have um, girlfriends and... Oh, yeah, I do. You know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, they give them a flat, and then they have babies, and they get, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> Everybody does that, but okay. <laughs> but he called um, my job, and he said, um, Are you cook? Is your mother cooking? You know, because he knew I lived at home. Is your mother cooking for Thanksgiving? So I said, Yeah, you know, we have a family, you know, black, because I'm black, because I'm not going to say I'm mixed or anything else. I'm black. And yeah, she's going to cook. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm black, I'm black. Yeah, she's going to cook. So Just he likes to mimic, you, you know, he's, he was funny too. <laughs> so he said, um, well, tell your mommy not to cook because I'm going to prepare Thanksgiving meal. So I went home and I told my mother. So my mother just looked at me. So I said, but she knew about Italians, right? She, but she just wasn't going to talk to me about them. So I said, he said, don't cook. So she knew you just were hanging out, out with these guys. <laughs> so someone came to pick me up Thanksgiving morning. And we went to the restaurant, and his whole family, all the food was there. They said, oh, you can sit down and eat. I said, no, I want to go home. I'd rather eat with the family because I felt a little uncomfortable. And um, I 
didn't want his wife and his aunt and his uncle start cutting me up, but <laughs> they probably already did. <laughs> you just didn't know it. <laughs> but everybody was. There's a difference. Everybody was like. ready to save someone, you know, save someone from the streets or whatever was going to get them. Like, pull them out of that quicksand. And help them. Yeah. So yeah. I said, no, 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 I got to go home. So he had two of his boys. And we lived in, uh, in the Bronx, in a place like The Godfather was um, filmed with all uh, the different sections, towers, they call it the castle, it's still there. And then I get out of the, we get out of these limousines or whatever, big Cadillacs or what, with all these bins of food. And I said, I was with the Black Panthers and the Young Lords But for some reason, I, even myself, is guilty of this. We never thought about inviting another unknown person for Thanksgiving. Well, the Black Panthers did. Hmm? The Black Panthers did. No, white they, people. Oh, okay. In the beginning, they, you know. All right. Um, And towards the end, where they were all killed, the students for democratic society, they were Caucasian, yeah. When they were all shot in Oakland at that final um, encounter. But I said, this is totally unbelievable. And by then, I knew who he, wa who he was. And I said, Even though I knew that in the past, Al Capone used to do the same thing in Chicago. He would feed the homeless every day, though. But they never tell you that. Right. That's the true meaning of giving. You just give freely from your heart without mentioning it. And the reason I'm telling my story is because there's so much racism going on and negative talking between Italian and black people and that even Columbo, that he wasn't a true activist. Yes, he was. He was a civil rights activist before he even proclaimed himself on TV. But you see, when you make a choice in life, like he did early, a commitment to the Costa Nostra, to the black hand, that's permanent. But you see, in the black culture, like Malcolm X and a few others who were pimps, decided to change and become civil rights leaders, you can. Because we did not have armies of strength like that, and we still don't. Even to this day, we have no civil rights leaders as we had in the 60s and 70s. The last one to die was Huey P. Newton in 1979. And they said drugs were surrounding him. It's unfortunate that we can't, well, it's, even in the Italian community, 
in the last couple of decades, there hasn't been a leader. What about um, as strong as Colombo? You see, as strong as Malcolm X, as strong as Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Jesse Jackson. Al Sharpton. It seems like everybody's a little more passive. You don't have to be violent. Dr. Martin Luther King used to always give powerful speeches, especially when I've been to the mountaintop. And he was nonviolent. You know, I, I don't know if I could stand and let somebody beat me up. I'm more of a Malcolm X type person. <laughs> but, you know, it took special people. Like you said, he was very a very strong leader. And I think the reason people might be a little bit more passive now is because of the urgency. Back then, you know, they had separate bosses to drink out of. There was segregation. You know, there was, yeah, well, it, was, it, was you know, it was more urgent then. Very, very urgent. Now, you know, we have these things. We have, you know, unity. We can go to the same colleges. We can go to the same schools. Uh, we can vote. See, they they died and fought for people to vote. We can we can do all those things now. So I think that's why the leaders now are a little bit more passive because of the urgency of the matter that they're fighting for. But right now. We're fighting for our youth and even for our families because of this fentanyl. Oh my These God. These drugs are more potent. So you have to understand back in the day, I even said cocaine was acceptable. It, it didn't kill you. And it didn't make you um, overly aggressive. It made you more passive and nice. But until we started mixing it with other chemicals, yep. you know, because the chemists wanted to make more quick money fast, that's how crack was made. You see, when crack was introduced into the neighborhoods in First Harlem, it spread like wildfire overnight. <laughs> it did. It brought us to our knees. It really did. It it killed communities. I, I watched that happen. Um, you're you're always chasing the first hit. That's what I hear. And so you can never get enough. And a lot of people just didn't survive. And and I you know I think that you know in in some terms a lot of neighborhoods were not meant to survive. And that was the purpose of it. But you see, it's not only the drug users who want their drugs. I don't know who these chemists are, but they seem to just advertently mixing fentanyl in everything. That's right. And if somebody, you know what I learned about that? Um, and I just learned this in school. They have, I guess, this fentanyl Narcam, you know, to, to deactivate it or to save your life or whatever. It stimulates your heart back. Yeah. yeah. So if someone, the reason they have it is not just for the people that are having attacks. If you touch someone that's ODing, then you can OD as well. Did you know that? I know. I did not know Me, that. Me, yeah, I just found out. I was like, okay. Because I was like, why do they have this in, in school hallways? If somebody's that strung out, are they even going to be here? Or, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's the purpose of it, to save both people. If you touch someone that's OD and you, it goes right into your skin, you can OD as well. That's crazy. Things have become more complicated in a decade mm -hmm. because we didn't have computers, we didn't have cell phones. Social media. <laughs> and we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have you 
YouTube. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> TikTok. <laughs> we didn't have any of that stuff. So this is why it's more urgent to have leaders in all cultures. And another thing that surprised me was I said, let me Google. I never Google. <laughs> like, I didn't believe that Google would answer your question. Oh, yeah, they will. Okay, so I Google the Italian American League of Brooklyn. And so Google Boob gave me an answer that they located around Pennsylvania Avenue. And they had all these programs for all these nationalities. I said, Mr. Colombo must be so happy. <laughs> that his passion is still alive. And also happy that people still celebrate him as a mob boss, but... His legacy will live forever. <laughs> so I was so happy because at that time in that area, it was completely Caucasian. So I'm like, wow, after school programs, all these mentoring, I said, why isn't this celebrated everywhere? Maybe everybody just doesn't know about it. So I guess after they listen to your story, they will know. No, that's... That's really no excuse because... You can't celebrate look, what you don't know. I know, but look at Harlem. You have all the programs, Adam Clayton Powell, the Teresa Hotel. How can we still segregate into certain areas, but we can't move out? I don't know. That's a good question. I guess some part of that negative system just perpetuates on and on. You gotta, you know, um, I think you gotta have a vision. And I am a person that came from, you know, an area like that, like Father Panic Village. Mm -hmm. If you, we were brought up in Father Panic Village and it, I don't know, I think they had like 42 buildings, you saw the same thing and you just live that system and you think that's all there is growing up there as a child. If somebody doesn't broaden your horizons and take you out of that and show you that there's something else, then you don't have anything to compare it to. And so that's why I say you don't know what you don't know. You know, and if they don't teach it in school, you know what I mean? If they could, you know, like now, they can take you to places on a computer. You could go to Africa, you could see what it's like, you could go to Europe, you can experience travel through a computer. So back then, like in the 60s, we didn't have that. And so that's why you saw the same negative family situation perpetuate generation after generation because they were just like, it was like quicksand. You were running in place. You didn't know any better. You didn't have anywhere to go. And then, you know, there's the, um, the, finance, the monetary portion of it. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, generational wealth is, is key. Like, I don't know if you heard about this, but it was in a paper a few months ago where this black family owned beach property. I think it was in California and um, it was taken from them. And so just recently their, you know, the um, surviving family members fought and got that property back. Back then the property was worth $1,200. Just this year in 2022 it was worth 20 million. So their family did not get to enjoy that generational wealth, that money, that education, that travel, that everything that came with it. And so that's one of the, um, I think that's one of the main reasons where we're stuck in these negative, you know, poor situations because of money.
if it's taken away from you or if you start with nothing, you have nothing and you have nothing to give to your, your offspring. We have more black and Puerto Rican children being educated, young adults graduating from college, even like myself when I graduated from college. And you could be the top half of your class, which I was, but when you go to look for a job, I'm not either that frozen, and that was another way to keep us out of the... It was what, frozen? Yeah, frozen, you know, <laughs> like, they weren't hiring the oh, more social okay. workers. Yeah, frozen. Yeah. That's the word they use in New York. Oh, okay. the positions are frozen right now. Yeah, we're not hiring now. Sorry. <laughs> and the only positions that are open now is to be like in the beginning with my aunt back in the early 1900s, a teacher. And now it's even more extremely difficult to be a teacher besides the age that you already put on. So it seems like we can't never progress ahead, but all the luxury jobs or the jobs that we couldn't um, afford to taken our curriculum, like I'm so glad that Soundview is giving me the experience to learn to edit and learn about all this equipment, things that was never exposed to me. And let me tell you, I'm 71. Oh, and that's good. a damn shame. You look good, girl. <laughs> I had to get that in, sorry. <laughs> But let me, let me say something about the jobs. Um, that's where, you know, when we were turned down or all these jobs was frozen and this, that, and the other, if you look now, there are so many signs for help wanted almost all over the place. But uh, that's where black entrepreneurship came into play. A lot of people that got the door slammed in their faces so many times, they started their own companies and there's a lot of small black businesses as a result of that. So they don't have to wait for someone to give them an opportunity. They create their own opportunity. And I think that's awesome. But as they open, some of them close and they never make the profits that their Caucasian counterparts Make. That's true I'm in sorry, some cases. Because we uh -huh. don't, you know, we don't support, and other people don't support us. When your soul food restaurant opens, we support it, but then not that many others do. But when an Italian restaurant opens, everybody supports it because everybody goes for Italian food. You understand? Like I we do. have disparity so much in our American culture. I think my soul food is the best, so I really don't go to soul food restaurants. <laughs> I, but I understand what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I, I understand what you mean. I, we we Chinese, need support. I, I know that you... Oh, yes. They do. The, there's a saying, and um, I heard this from a black billionaire. He said, one dollar stays in the Asian community I think something like 30 days, and don't quote me on this, it's something like that. And one dollar stays in the Italian community, something like 15 days, and one dollar stays in the black community, like six hours, so I hear you. We have to start supporting our culture, and that's how we're gonna get strong, but I believe the way to do that, it starts with family, you know, it starts with our men marrying our women and not just having children. It starts with the family, and that's where it all begins, for me anyway. Um, the, the family, the, the business, and the support, you know, you learn all that from the family. But you're right, you're right. I hear what you're saying, we don't you support. You see, gentrification, reconstruction of the urban areas 
There are no, we don't have no neighborhoods. They spread the black and Latin people all around because they weren't going to create any more projects or ghettos. So it's going to be very hard, you know, you know, there's a system. And it took me all these years, because I'm looking at it, I'm seeing it happen between, before my eyes. I could never move back into the neighborhood in New York, in Manhattan, Washington Heights that I was born. The rent there is 2000 Exactly. And you only, it's, it's, you don't get as much there. The cost of living is so high. I would love to go to New York to go shopping, see a show in this, that, and the other, but. And we're not even talking about a glamorous area. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're not. So anyway, um, I, we have about maybe two minutes left. Oh, really? Because I didn't get yes. to. So that's why I'm letting you know. Oh, now we got only one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> this hour went by so fast. I mean, Mr. Colombo. I'm sorry, America, that I got off the topic. That's okay. About that's okay. Mob and Joe Colombo. But I'm going to be back and it's... I'm going to stick to the topic and we're going to talk about the Philadelphia mob. I've never been in Philadelphia, <laughs> but they helped me too when I was a young girl. So I was just lucky. <laughs> so next show, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you on. for having me. We're going to talk about the Philadelphia Mafia next. Yes. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. This is the David Goodman Reality and Truth Show and we're on your side.